get started. Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight thanking you, Lord, for uh, who you are and for blessing us each day. Thank you for getting us here safely. Thank you for this time for us to be able to gather as a family to feed on your word. Um, thank you for the sacrifice that our pastor puts in and studying and, and spending the time to teach us and to help us grow. Um, please get anyone here safely that hasn't arrived and allow us to have an enjoyable evening. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. All right. How's everybody? Good. I got a song on my heart. Y'all like to hear it? Here's how it go. Y'all sing it with me. Uh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord been so good you no 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 that's that ain't man you've been so good you've been so good you've been so good I just want to thank you Lord all right, all right, all right. Amen, amen. amen. We're going to have some worship. Amen. amen, amen. All right, who was here last week? And remember what we went over. What did we go over last week? Somebody, anybody, shout it out. The fall. The fall, the fall. And that was taken from what? Genesis what? Three. We said here, um, it didn't take long for things to go bad. He cre um, In the beginning, God created um, the heavens and the earth. He was hovering all, all about the earth before, and then he started to create. Let there be light. Let there be um, wild beasts of the field and vegetation and all these different things. And then he came to his prize um, creation, which is mankind. He said, let us create man in his own, in our own image. Sorry. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Um, then he goes to Genesis 2, and he talks about, his creation a little bit more got rested. Remember at the beginning of Genesis 2 and then creation plays out and then it doesn't take very long for creation, at least man in creation to go south because the trees were still treeing, birds were still birding and everything was still behaving according to the structure that God had set out. But then um, all of a sudden in Genesis 3, um, there was a little conflict. So we call that um, the fall or original sin. So all sin comes from that moment it entered into the earth. Um, there's a separation between God um, and mankind because God will not be a part of sinful nature. Um, and the only way back to him is a sacrifice has to be made, right? So in that instance, um, you know, even though God banished them from the garden, um, he didn't permanently punish them um, in a way that they weren't protected or covered. So he, he still had provision for them. He still had love for them. Um, he, he clothed them with garments, but um, it was at the hand of an animal. An animal was sacrificed and blood was shed. Um, and all throughout the Old Testament, remember, um, that was the atonement that was made um, to get back in right standing with God. You had to sacrifice something um, that was dear to you, right? So an animal became the sacrifice um, until he said, I'll send one, my one and final sacrifice. Now we're going to move forward. We're still in the book of Genesis. We're going to skip ahead a few chapters. Um, everybody have their handout? All right, this, is, this should be some really good stuff for us. Um, we're going to talk about covenants, um, you know, God's covenants and his covenant with Abraham, specifically the we're going to study and drill down on um, the, the covenant with Abraham. But what is a biblical covenant? Covenant? I, I, I'll start it. Um, a covenant is a sacred agreement or promise between God and humans, um, often involving mutual commitment. So it's not just one sided people. Um, that don't understand God, think that God is a God that's like a slave driver, right? And he's just co commanding and barking orders at us. But God's commitment for us is always going to be greater than the sacrifice or the obedience required to receive his blessing, right? So uh, on one end of the commitment, on one end of the covenant is God making a commitment. Um, he says, if you do this, then I'll do this. And the then is always greater than the if, 
right? God is always doing something um, just that surpasses any commitment or any sacrifice that we had to lay down, right? Um, again, if you, anyone who believes in the son, any, if you call on the name of the son, you shall be saved, right? So all we have to do is agree that Christ is the Lord and, and, and really believe it in our heart. And then he, what comes along with it is salvation, the Holy Spirit, um, the covering and, and the removing of all of our sins, um, and so on and so forth. So we have a, a small part to play, but then we understood what happened last week if we don't fulfill the commitment. Right. Because God told them they have peace. They have communion with him. They have a perfect relationship. Um, God is always going to be there with them and for them. Um, and, but he said, don't eat of this tree. They did. They ate of the tree. And then there was a, there was a, um, a consequence. Right. We saw consequence. Right. So that's a covenant is that um, usually between God and humans involving mutual commitments. And then there's different characteristics of a covenant. Right. The divine initiation. So we can't say to God. Okay, God, I want to enter into a covenant with you. I was thinking, um, if you do this, then I'll do this. It doesn't work that way. It's initiated by God. We can't, um, and, and sometimes we, we've, we've tried. Um, you know, we'll try to make, anybody ever made um, one of them holy ghost commitments? Like, okay, I'll ne if you do this, if you get me out of it this time, I'll never do it again. Sometimes it may be grace or even mercy for the situation, um, but that's not how God works in the natural, right? You know, sometimes you may throw us a bone, but m but most in most cases, you're going to suffer a consequence if you've done something. So um, don't try to get into a habit of initiating the covenant or the agreement with God. God makes the covenants, we agree to them um, or not agree to them, right? So divine initiation. Covenants are often initiated by God who sets the terms and conditions. Um, they are binding agreements. A covenant is a formal and binding agreement that establishes a relationship between the parties involved. Um, and then number three, promises and obligations. Covenants typically include promises made by God and obligations or conditions that humans are expected to fulfill. Um, anybody follow Myron Golden on the Internet? Uh, that sounds like a guy that you follow. B. You, if you're not following him, wake up. You got to follow him, man. He, he's. He's really phenomenal. Um, it's an it's a, um, older African-American gentleman, uh, with lower haircut, with a, with a gray beard. Um, but he, he's all over the Internet. He used to do full-time ministry. Now he's, a, he's in ministry, but he's, a, he's an entrepreneur as well. Um, and he talks a great deal about God in all of his business talks, right? Um, but he talks, he, 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 the, oh, you're too late now, man. Now you're interrupted. <laughs> oh, I know who this guy is. <laughs> like, you know. uh, but, but yeah, he's, he's really phenomenal. I, I, you know, he's one of the people I, I would say from the stage, he, he's, he's, he's good to follow. But he talks about the, God, the promises of God and the obligations of human beings. And he says the Old Testament and new alike are full of them, right? Um, but especially the Old um, Testament. But just be careful because um, here, here's the thing, and, I, and I'm going to mention it a couple of times. Um, God is not... We're not bound by, nor is God bound by every single Old Testament Testament covenant to non-Jewish people, right? Uh, I'm gonna say it again, like uh, in another way. Some covenants are made for everybody. Some covenants were made for just the people who received that covenant, right? If you know anything about the Bible, and this is what you got to know, if you don't know, the Bible is written to us, no, for us, but not to us. The Bible is written for us, but not to us. It's written to God's children, right? His chosen people, right? The children of Israel. He's writing directly to Jewish people. It's written, especially the Old Testament, right? Now, the New Testament, there's a new covenant, um, but still it's written a lot for Jews and it's written a lot for new converts, but then we can adapt, we've adapted to it and we've been grafted in or adopted in. So it's written for us, but not to us. This, in the same way, um, let's say, uh, Brandon, right? He has a relationship and he writes this love letter. That's amazing, right? It's written to his sweetheart, but there's things in there that I could pull out and they could work when he's making commitments and saying, I'll be the man that you need me to be and so on and so forth. Right. And he, and he, so there's things that can be pulled out and applied to everybody, but it's written for her. Uh, I mean, yeah, to her, but it's for all of us. Does, does that make sense? So it's not written to, but it's written for. So the promises and obligations um, in there, there are some of them that are permanent, that no matter 
if you're Jew or Gentile, no matter if you were born back then when they made the agreement or if you're born, you know, people aren't even born yet. They can walk into these promises because they're eternal promises. But some of them were temporary. God is saying, if you do this now, then I'll do this. Meaning like, you know, if people were enslaved or captured. So, for instance, you can't be in jail um, saying stuff that the children of Israel are saying and, and, and hoping that God brush you out like he did um, the, 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 um, the children of Israel. Right. You, you know, that that that's not for those. It's not for that. But then there's certain promises. If you uh, fulfill the obligation, then you will reap the harvest. Right. And we can talk about that. And then signs and seals covenant are uh, often have physical signs or seals to signify an agreement. For example, the rainbow in Noah's covenant, um, circumcision in Abraham's covenant, um, and, 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 and there's many more in the Old Testament. And then I just mentioned this perpetual or temporary. Some covenants are everlasting. Uh, for example, the Abrahamic covenant, the one that we're going to be talking about today, while others may be conditional and temporary. Right. So, again, written not to us, but it's written for us. So here's some covenants in the Bible, right? And maybe one day we can study these in depth, but we're going to drill down on the second one today. But before the Abrahamic covenant, there's the Noahic covenant, right? And that's found in Genesis chapter 9. God promises um, Noah after the flood um, he, with the rainbow. You know, the rainbow symbolized the, the end of the flood um, and that he said he'd never destroy the earth by flood again. So he made a covenant, right? And we haven't had another flood that's destroyed the earth. Um, and I, who was that? That I think that was Brandon. You visited like a, a, a Noah's Ark um, kind of um, um, ex exhibit and everything like that. You talk about how grand and right around Louisville, Kentucky, right? Um, and it's real. There, there's places in the earth that have marked still um, by evidence of the flood. Right. You know, it, um, you know, people have, have studied it and, and it's just a, a great, uh, I, I guess, example or showing of God's grace and mercy and love. Um, but but there's proof that the flood existed. Um, Abrahamic covenant. We'll drill down on this today. Genesis 12, 15 and 17. We're going to be taking parts from there. Um, God promises God's promises to Abraham to make him a great nation, give him descendants and bless all nations through him. Then there was the Mosaic covenant made to Moses, of course, um, and that's in Exodus chapter 19 through 24. Um, the covenant between God and Israel at my, Mount Sinai involving the giving of the law, the Torah, and the Ten Commandments, right? So anybody know what the Torah is? I think it's like the first, what, nine books of the Old Testament? First five, close. First five? Uh, yeah, um, books of the, of the law. Um, including the, the, the Ten Commandments are in there, but the Torah is the first five books. Anybody know the first five books of the Bible for bonus points? Pass it to... Go on and say it. Put yourself out there, sis. <laughs> Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. No, well, amen. Numbers. Numbers, Deuteronomy. <laughs> there you go. Gen Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Very good. Very good. And then there's the Davidic covenant um, in 2 Samuel 7. God promises David that his descendants would rule Israel forever, ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Right now, that one got kind of hairy. Um, God still fulfilled it. Um, but what happened after David, I mentioned it, um, is that his, his children didn't take care of the kingdom. Um, but still, it was still in the bloodline to where there was 14 generations before David, um, and then David's born, and then there's 14 generations after David until Jesus Christ is born. And Jesus Christ is in the direct bloodline of, of David, right? Um, and then there's the new covenant. This is the one we participate in, right? Um, holy. Um, again, there's parts of the first four that are permanent, and then a lot of it is temporary. It was just for that day. Right. And we'll, we'll talk about the differences later. We just don't have time to go into all of them today. Um, but uh, but in the new covenant, it's fully it's for all of us. All who accept Jesus Christ are all covered under the new covenant. Right. So it's first mentioned in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. And then it, it is established in Luke 22 and 20. So it's established by Jesus Christ through the death and the, through his death and resurrection promises an, a new relationship with God based on faith 
an internal transformation rather than external law. So what is that internal transformation? What do we know of him as? The Father, the Son, and the, the Holy Ghost. That's the only, only the power of the Holy Spirit um, can compel us to even come to Jesus. It's not by our good decision making. Um, it's the Holy, Vic, the Holy Spirit that both the Bible describes as convicts us and encourages us to say yes to Jesus Christ. We can't even be drawn to him, um, the Bible says, in, unless the Holy Spirit is drawn us. Now, the good thing is the Holy Spirit is, is constantly drawing everyone. Now, there are some people who have denounced God and who are against him. Um, so the, 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 the opportunity is still there, but maybe not as regularly as those who aren't blaspheming the Holy Spirit, right? So there's people out there literally that are worshiping Satan that God is still calling. Right now, I don't know how I don't know how it works, but I, I, my my mind tells me there's still opportunity for them. But they're out there worshiping the devil and things like that. So God may not be pursuing the same as he's pursuing everybody. I could be completely wrong because he wants everybody. But but on a daily basis, I know those who are lost. He's trying to get them found. Right. But then there's some people because the Bible even says of Christians that he'll turn you over to a reprobate mind. So somebody can challenge me on that, but then I'm like, well, if he would allow Christians to walk away, why wouldn't he allow people in the world that don't want them to kind of stay out there just a little bit longer? Again, I could be completely wrong, but I, I'm just going by what I understand the word to say. Anybody heard of that? He'll give, he'll give you over to a, a reprobate mind. So this is people who continue to um, put sin in front of God, and they continue to just desire to do things that are not of God. So eventually, he'll, he'll turn you over to that thing. Right. You know, and let you be out there for a while. So, f for instance, like uh, the pro and a good example, that's like the prodigal son. Right. You, you, you're there with the king and it's like, oh, OK, you want to go out there and live on your own. Right. And he went out there and had it real tough and real bad. And then eventually the Bible says he came to himself, meaning the spirit of God just came back upon him. And he said, what am I doing out here? And, and many of us have had those kinds of moments where you just want to do your own thing. Right. Um, you know, and then eventually you figure out. Man, this ain't the way to go. Now, sometimes it comes with hitting your, your head on, on the ground. This is why some people come to God after they've gone to prison or after they've hit what, what, what the world calls rock bottom, right? And people say silly things like, oh, he's only doing that because he went to jail or he got in trouble or something. Like, well, yeah, that's the best time to do it. When you're in trouble, call upon the name of the Lord. I'm like, let's not, you know, talk about those people, right? So those are the five covenants. Um, one day, maybe the next study, we can just go through and study and break down the covenants in more detail. But today, and, and in purposes of us moving through the Bible, we're going to talk about the Abraham covenant. Um, God's covenant with Abraham is foundational to understanding his plan of redemption and faithfulness throughout the Bible. This covenant highlights God's promises and his unwavering faithfulness to fulfill them, right? If you know the story, you might know the story of Abram slash Abraham, Sarai slash Sarah. So we won't cover it all today. We're going to cover just the covenantal part, but it's a deep story. Like, you know, and, 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 and we're much like, anybody ever read the Bible and get a little judgy from time to time? Like, how could they do that? Like, you know, like they was with Jesus. Why did they just go back fishing after he died? Like, you know, that kind of stuff. Like, I'm, I kind of read the Bible like that. They didn't have the luxury of knowing what was happening in the next chapter, right? And their faith wasn't as strong as ours should be. We have proof and evidence in the word. Plus, God has moved in so many of our lives on such a consistent basis um, that we should never waver or go back. But it's human, right? And one person described it, a good friend of ours said, because I said, man, I don't know how people have these encounters with God, and then they go back. And he said, well, it's predictable. It happened all throughout the Bible. Look at Peter. Now, he's the one, oh, they over my dead body, Lord. They're going to have to go through me before they get to you. And he's the first one saying, man, I don't know this dude. Like, you, you understand what I'm saying? Like, you know, so we all have these moments. Um, but in, in the case of, um, you know, Abraham, um, it was kind of a wild story. So I encourage you to read it um, throughout the week for yourself. Um, you know, you can, re you can pick it up through some of the scriptures that we're going through, but we're only going to go through a few. But um, tw um, Genesis 12, Genesis 15, and Genesis 17 are the main scriptures that you want to read to where when God gives a promise, um, and then I don't know if it's doubt or it's taking too long, but any of us try to take things into our own hands a time or two. Like God, we know God has promised us something, and then we go out and try to make it happen. Like we're trying to help God. Like, and then next thing you know, we birthed an Ishmael, right? If you know about the story, that, that's in there to where 
he, 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 you know, God promises him a baby. He's like, oh, well, my wife is old, like, you know, and his wife came up with a solution. I'm old, you old, but let's help, let's help God out. And they bring him a handmaiden or one of the servants. They make this baby that ain't got nothing to do with God's promises. Then they had a bigger problem on their hands and all this stuff. But God is still faithful to his promise um, the same way he is with us because God knows all things. So he knows even when he gives um, Corey a word that I might mess it up, but there's still provision in there. Um, as long as I still have faith, because it's not that Abraham didn't have faith. He just thought that he could help God out. So as long as you have faith, <laughs> if you, as long as you have faith, God will see that thing through. Right. And there's provision even for the mistakes that are made along the road. So the key themes um, to what we're talking about are God's promises. Um, the promises made to Abraham include land, descendants, and blessings, right? So I put all this in there um, for you. But then another key theme is faith and obedience, right? Faith and obedience are required in our Christian walk. Um, it, it says, that the Bible says that um, no man can come to God except through faith, right? Faith is the only thing that really pleases God. Um, it's not what we can do on our own. It's what we have faith to believe in what he said that he'll do with us or for us or through us. Right. You know, the things that we can't see. Right. Um, read or uh, reference Hebrews 11 1. Right. Write that down for yourself. Um, but but having faith in not the, not in our own ability or not what we can see, but having faith in the unseen things um, that God has promised. Um, and then obedience. It, it's, it's an absolute requirement. Um, and here, here's a test. It, it's controversial in the Christian community. But can God bless you in a state of disobedience? Right, yeah, the heads are going, yes. And, and, and we know for our, our own lives, he absolutely has, right? Now, that's not a way to live, and I don't encourage it, um, but some people are afraid to say that, right? In fact, pastors have argued, it's like, uh, no, if you want God to bless you, you got to be obedient. It's like, well, what about all the times that I've been disobedient and God still blessed me to show me that he was God, to show me his love? He showed me love, right? Um, and then if he only rewarded your obedience, then we'd be obedient just to gain something sometimes, right? It's just like even the principle of even sowing and giving, right? It's obedient to sow where God says to sow. So in church or with people who are less fortunate and things like that. But even if you don't, uh, many of you still have gainful employment. You've still received opportunity. You've still gotten promotions and raises. Like not everybody that's, that's, that's getting those promotions and raises are tithers. Does that make sense? Um, but it allows him to bless you all the more through your obedience, right? So it, there's parts in the Bible where he says, now try me on this, right? Because God loves all his people, but those who are obedient, I believe that he's reserved extra special blessings for. Let's just say it that way. So, and, and then it says that obedience is greater than sacrifice, right? So do it because out of righteousness. Don't do it because, oh, man, I got to give God this hundred dollars i'd have made a thousand dollars i gotta give him this hundred dollars like you know he'd rather you keep it he don't want you to give anything progressively he don't want you to do something like anybody got kids in here you tell them hey go do this and they're like ah. don't you just hate that as a parent god hates it more he's like hey hey, hey no, look sometimes you be like because you know it's a reward on the other end of it sometimes you're like oh don't worry about it don't worry about it i do it and you withhold a good thing now, sometimes God is that way, but he's not withholding something, but he know, But what he does do is on the other side of that is a blessing because the, the, the promises of God are yes and amen. So if he promises something, it's available to you. But if you don't follow through, you, that means that you, you don't make it to the end where the blessing is. It's not like he's just taking it away, right, you know. Um, so that's faith and obedience and then God's faithfulness despite human shortcomings. Um, God's faithfulness endures. Somebody say Amen. So um, the call to Abraham, this is when Abraham is called. Where's my first reader? Read us Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Amen. Right in the beginning, what does God call Abraham to do? Uh, 12.1. Because um, the blessing ain't coming to you. What does he say to do? Go back to one. Get out of your country. You have to leave, right? Many times when God wants to bless us, we have to get out of our comfort zone. 
right? It, because and it requires great faith. Now, what we don't, what we're not reading here is that Abraham was a man of great means. He was rich, and he came from a rich family, right? His daddy was very rich, and I learned some stuff about Abraham at this conference I just went to. His dad was called um, to go do something great, but it, but his brother died, right? And you, it's in it's in prior scripture. So his dad said, "I will not leave from this place," right? And he named the place something that had to do with his son dying. And he was prosperous still there. God still blessed him because he was obedient, but it was partial obedience. So um, some of the things that God promises us, if we don't fulfill it, then it will be fulfilled um, down our bloodline somewhere, right? So Abraham was the one because God had already called his dad to go do something. But his dad was heartbroken, and he, and he couldn't move, or he decided, I'm not moving beyond here. We're just going to be out in this place. Um, and they were very prosperous, but then the the the, the um, desire of God and the promise picked back up through Abraham, right? And he, so he says, get out of your country. Why? Because it requires great faith to go and get what God is promising you in many cases. Like, wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be dope if, like, we could just stay in bed and blessings just showed up? No, you got to get up and have faith. You got to go on the interview that you're not qualified for, that God set up for you. You got to go in there and not, not sell no lie, but just... Just sell your qualities that God has given you. Look, I don't have a degree, you know, and I don't do this, and I haven't had a job like this, but, like, you know, these are the skills that I have. And it'd be, and if it's for you, it's exactly what they need. Like, you know, that was for you, nothing, nobody can take it away. So God had a blessing for him that he had to get away from. And then here's the promise. I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you and make your name great, um, and you shall be a blessing. Now, y'all, don't be praying um, Genesis 12:3. Um, for the haters, the word says that I will curse those who curse you. So God curse them. That's not our place. That's God that makes that agreement with you, right? You know, the Bible and Jesus says, bless those who curse you. Love those who hate you. Love your enemies, right? And he came because they had a misunderstanding about this stuff, as do we. We clinch onto the scriptures that we want to apply to our life, and we ignore the ones that make us uncomfortable, Right, so we want our haters punished, right? But but Jesus, said, so they had a bunch of misunderstandings. So that's why in the Beatitudes, remember I preached on that. He said, you say this. So there's a misunderstanding about what I've said. This is your understanding of it. This is what you say. Curse those who curse you. Um, you know, the, 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 what does he say? The um, eye for an eye and that kind of stuff. He's like, no, y'all you, misusing that. You say this, I say this, bless those who persecute you, persecute you. And how about this, go as far as to love your enemy. And, and that's not just a person you kind of don't like, but if anybody ever raised their voice and said out their mouth that they hate somebody, yeah, that's who you're supposed to love. Love your enemy. And I'm like, man, that's a hard thing. It, with man, it's impossible, with, but with God, all things are possible. You see, if you just apply the scripture and, and live the scripture, and, and again, it, just because you say it, that don't make it no easier. But I thank God for his grace. But if we can begin to understand Jesus and understand how we've been forgiven, um, then we have a better shot. We just, you're practicing it just like a doctor. And every single day, you just beat, try to beat your best. Like, and we're going to fall and, and fail at it. Um, and again, you see people, men of the cloth lately, like falling um, and, and, and having huge public failures. Right after 30 and 40 years in ministry and things like that. Because none of us are perfect. Any of us can have a day. But all we have to do to be forgiven by God is just repent and get back up and keep on walking, walking in the path of righteousness, right? Um, only one that had this all the way right was Jesus, right? So we apply the scripture to our life, and we do the very best we can with it every single day. Um, so don't be praying this over nobody, amen? There's more scriptures in Psalms, and sometimes people be telling me, I, you know, I just pray, like, Lord, get them. And I, I don't say nothing because I know, I know where they're at, and I've done it before, too. And I be doing it sometime too. Let's just be honest. But then the Lord will reel me back in. But I say this. Jesus Christ is final authority. He says that all authority has been given to me. Right? So forget what you heard. Go by the red letters. If there's no other Bible that we could ever subscribe to, it's just if Jesus said it, just do that. Right? Because it's the fulfillment of everything that was written before and everything that can ever come is, has come through Jesus Christ. Amen? So the main points, call to leave. Abram. It's called to leave his country, family, and father's house. This move required faith and obedience because guess what? The blessings weren't coming to him, 
right? Um, and many times, again, that's what we have to do. We just have to move, get up and move. Blessings are right outside of our comfort zone. Why? Because outside of our comfort zone requires us to have faith. This young man just came back from, wh where were you in school at, Dietrich? New Mexico, right? Had you ever been there or did you know? That? But So it required some faith to go there, right? Because were you from the Antelope Valley prior? So you lived here most of your life, and then an opportunity came up, not in the Antelope Valley, not in Southern California, but in New Mexico. Where, did you know anybody before you went? N not a soul, right? But it required faith it, to, to further the dream and the passion that God has put on the inside of his heart. And we've all been faced with that. What happens if he don't go? If he says, oh, what's well, a local college here at ABC? Maybe I'll go play there for two years, and, and then I'll go transfer to like UCLA. What if the opportunity don't come the way that we desire for it to come? That's us trying to make a covenant with God. God, I'm going to work real hard and get good grades. I'm going to be the first one to practice, and I'm going to be the, the example on a team and captain. I'm going to stay here local and then send me to the college of my choice. If that ain't how God is doing it, guess what? That ain't how he's doing it. The opportunity is where God sends you and where he opens up for you, right? And this man wouldn't have been pursuing his dream no more had he tried to do it his own way, right? Um, so that's a good example, and many of us have similar examples. So covenant promises. God promised them, right, land, um, um, na a nation. God promises a bless, you know, him to be a blessing and global impact. So let's, let's have a quick discussion here before we jump to the next one. Uh, faith in actions. Abram's willingness to leave everything behind demonstrates his faith. We, we kind of covered that. Um, God's sovereignty. Um, the promises... Um, show God's control over nations and history. Listen, whatever God's promises are, and it may seem too big for us. When God promises you things that it deal with your purpose, it's always it's always going to be beyond you. This is how you know it's going to be your purpose, because you can't do it alone. Uh, for instance, just just using me as an example, when God promised me um, I was going to do full time ministry, I didn't really understand it. But he said, when you start trusting me, I'll start providing, right? So we start trusting him. Um, and then he opened up a space. I, can't, I went to Israel, and, and he spoke that word. And he can't, he, well, he re-spoke. He spoke when I was a kid, um, you know, just to kind of show me a preview, right? And many times he'll show you a snapshot preview. And then when I went to Israel, we came back, and then we started doing small group not too long after that. Well, um, our in-laws opened up their home, and it was a perfect space for the people that were coming. And we did it for quite a few years, right? And more, more and more people came. Um, and then he says, you're going to do full-time ministry. And B B Brandon was there. I know Latora was there. I, I don't know if the Martins were there, but a few of us were there. And then I was just, who was there? Tiffany was there. And the boldness of God came over me because I had never done that before in a public setting. Um, and I just declared some things like God is going to do it. It's zero chance that we lose. He's going to provide a place for ministry. I don't know how we're going to do it. I don't have the money. Our church that was supposed to be sending us out ran into some difficulties financially, so they couldn't send us. And I was like, ah, maybe we just start it. I was, I was going to, if I would have done it my way, I was going to like, I was prepared the next week or so, ask mom and pops, hey, you know how we be doing small group on um, Tuesday? Uh, can we do church on Sunday too? Like, because a lot of churches are birthed in living rooms. Like, and I was like, well, maybe I, I think I got, I got enough dollars I can scrape up. We can get a little storefront. We already had too many people coming to Tuesday Bible study, small group to where we wouldn't even fit in the storefront. The Lord gave me an opportunity to minister. Remember we went to that little church and it was a storefront. We bought our small group there, and they had like 10 members, and we brought our 30, 20 people or something, and it was already too many of us in there. So I said, well, this ain't going to work. Like, we don't even have any. So, God, I don't know how you're going to do it, but it's zero chance that we lose. And the moment I declared that, and I believed it, and I said, I know this like better than I know my name. I, I, I know this better than I know anything, that God is going to do it. And, and it was like a couple, two days later where the pastor of this church called me, I mean, said, come see him. That was on a, it was a Tuesday when I declared it. Well, so three days later, it was a Friday when he said, come see him. By Monday, we had a church, y'all. So before we even went back to small group, I, we went back and said, well, God did it. We didn't lose. <laughs> we, we ain't got to mess up your living room doing church every week, right? You know, God did it. I, I didn't try to make up a way. I was thinking, that, you know, in the back of my mind, I was like, well, dang, I can't be, I don't want to lie on God, but. I know it ain't a lie. I know that I know what I know. Like, because it was like one minute I didn't know it, and the next minute I knew everything about it. And God gave us a church just like that. Not just a storefront, not just a small church, but we sitting on five acres. We own, I mean, from the street to the, to the brick wall back there. Does that make sense? Like, you know, so God will do it. So many of us, there's blessings that are being held up because of our lack of faith and obedience. 
You got to show up to the meeting. You got to show up with faith. You got to declare it out of your mouth. You can't be silent about it, and you got to do exactly what God says to do, and then the blessings are on the other side. Here's the thing. You haven't forfeited anything because God still wants to get glory out of your life. There's some things that God has said to, for some of us to we should have probably done a long time ago, but, but God is just waiting on you to be obedient. Right. You know, their scripture is all about it where it's like, hey, man, good look, got to blow life in the, in the old bones. They'll come back to life. So from the Old Testament all the way to the New Testament, there's plenty of scriptural evidence that doesn't say you don't forfeit your blessing. God may recreate how he's going to do it, but he's going to do it. All you got to do is have faith in it. Right. Um, and so God's sovereignty, blessings and responsibility. Abram is blessed to be a blessing, emphasizing the responsibility to others. When God blesses you, it's never just for you. When he puts you on, don't put all your money into a Rolls Royce in a big old house, right? When he puts you on, ask, okay, God, I'm on now. What do I do with this? And the more obedient you are, the more room it allows for God to continue to bless you because there's plenty of people that forfeit that second and third blessing, right? Um, anybody seen The Nutty Professor? I went to go see it, and it was the most, at the time, it was the most hilarious movie I'd ever seen. But I had to go see it a second time because what would happen is the first joke would come, and everybody would bust up laughing hysterically, and we'd miss the second and third joke. And when I went back to see it the second time, anybody ever seen a movie the second and third time and it's better then? Right? That's how God's blessings are because if you're a little obedient, a little blessing come with it. And then the more obedient you, you remain, the bigger blessings is greater later. Right. Um, so you many people, they get to a certain point. Then they say, this is mine. Look at what I've done. And they invite people over to their big house and don't know about now. It, this is how, you know, people be out of bounds. And some of y'all might be in here. So, Lord, help me. Th th listen, God put you on. You got a big old nice house, but then you got rooms that can't nobody go into. <laughs> what kind of blessing is that? God don't just bless you for you. And, and, and hear me well. That don't, listen. I want you to keep your house nice. You don't want people trampling over your floor and stuff like that. But, but, but if God has blessed you with something that's beyond what you need, it's because he's trying to invite more people to the party. So they can, one, see the blessing that God has supplied you with, and two, see the possibility that could be for their life as well. So you, we're supposed to share in the blessings of God, right? I, I can't stay. I ain't going to say that, man. <laughs> I done been to somebody's house that had stuff roped off, like, and God bless, and they love them. Like, you know, but it's like, uh, uh, yeah, that's all I'm going to say about that. Don't be roping stuff off, right? Let's move. Genesis 15. Um, where, where's, where's my second reader? Um, somebody read Genesis 15, 1 through 6. This is the right one? Okay. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Yeah, okay, so hold right there. El Eliezer, Eliezer, um, these names, Old Testament. I think some of them died out because nobody could pronounce them, right? <laughs> um, but, but, but there, see... How obedient do you have to be? Abram didn't even get all of the instruction in Genesis 12. God just told him to go, and he started going. Now, don't we got to understand this about God. Sometimes God won't paint the whole picture because many of us won't believe him or we won't move anyway because we'll say, that's too hard, or it, 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 it just promote too many questions. Just, again, those who have kids, um, don't tell them where they're going at the end of the summer, at the, in the beginning of the summer. Is it time yet? Are we going yet? Is, is it time? How many more days? Is it this yet? Are we going? Like that kind of stuff, right? So just when it's time to get in the car, have them get in the car and you just take them there, right? Hey, we going somewhere. And that's what God has to do with his children because if he tells us the whole thing, then many of us, some of us may be disappointed because there's some people, again, if you got music in your heart, I'm going to be a world famous composer. Like we, we draw our own conclusion. Right. And God may want you to teach music to children and there may be a child in your ninth year of teaching that comes through there that come that becomes this great world music composer that you desire to be. Right. And, and, and what God looks counts as righteous is our obedience and inspiring the ones who we're supposed to inspire. What if your job is to be an awesome parent? What if your job is to be a music teacher? 
right, instead of being out there in front? What if your job is to set the table versus the one that's at the head of the table? What if your job is to build the stage versus the one standing on it? Does that make sense, right? You know, did, did you raise your hand? All right, let's pass it to Mike. Uh, so, so, so what we do is, uh, it's one right here. It's one right, oh, it's okay. It, but, but what we do is God gives us a piece of the vision, and he wants us to be obedient and just start walking. He says, go to a land that I will show you. Just start walking in this direction. He didn't know how far it was. He was just on a, a mission, right? He didn't complain. He started walking. They had some difficulties along the way. Um, he's like telling people, look, his, his wife must have been fine because she's 75, right, when they got the promise. And they go to somewhere. He's like, look, you fine. Don't tell nobody you my wife because they're going to try to kill me for you. So tell them you my sister. Right? And the dude tried to take his wife as a, the king took his, his wife as, as one of the ladies. In his, and now they're in trouble and God has to get her out. Like, so it's just this gnarly story that you got you to gotta read up on and follow. Like, you know, so they start drawing their own conclusions on how they're going to get it done. But all God called for is just be obedient just walk. Because there's provision, there's protection, and, and there's everything you need along the way. Um, you know, so don't deter. Go ahead. Obey the rules, understand the purpose. Sometimes we make our traditions our standards, not what the word says. Anything you exalt over God's word is an idol. Ooh, that's a bar. <laughs> that's what you said. And, and she, so for years, we'd have small group, and she said, oh, my book says this. I thought the book said it, like she bought a book that said, she'd be writing this stuff. And I'm like, is, I love you, but I know this has to be God inspired, like because there'd be some stuff in there. Like I, I literally thought she, uh, like a a, a a great philosopher or something, be writing this up. But this stuff is good. Like ain't that good? Like so, y'all might want to go take a picture or copy that after after. Cause, but that but that's that's a hundred percent truth, and that's what we do. Our traditions, or I'm used to, or I'm not used to, or like again back to the football is I don't know nobody out there, ain't nobody black out there, or like whatever it is, we give as an excuse. And he, even if you say it, do it anyway. Like like you know what I mean? Because that's where God wants to bless you. And then here's the problem: God says He's gonna do this for Abraham, but it ain't like Abraham has a gang of kids to choose from like David's dad, right? In fact, he has no kids to choose from. He's 99 when he gets to promise, and his wife is about 75, right? Um, and, and Abraham says, all I have is in my house is El Eliza of Damascus, and he's a trusted servant, so he's not even his son, right? And he would be the heir since Abraham had no children. So he's like, I'm doing all of this, and I don't even have any kids, all I have to leave it to is this guy. I'll, I'll do it, God, because he, he knew that when God made him the promise, so he was still marching towards the land where God was going to show him. But then now he's getting frustrated. Anybody ever got frustrated? Amen. Hey, man, share your frustration with God. God can handle it because now God gave him another piece of the puzzle because he must have been at a breaking point. It's like, but what, what are you going to give me? Like, how, how's this even going to happen? I don't have any kids. All I have is this guy. <laughs> like, you know, and God's like, and then read um, verse 3. Pastor, um, I just want to say one thing. Yeah, go ahead. One thing that's before that, it says, where there is unity, there is a commanded blessing. Amen. And um, keep the unity through the bond of spirit and peace. So as long as we are united, he, there's Amen. zero chance that we're not going to get zero that. chance. You pray it all in the same direction. Give it, give it to um, Bree, because Bree is dying to read um, Genesis 15, 3 through 6. I could just see it in that yawn that she was belting out. Um, the Holy Ghost was speaking. It's like, I want to read. Amen. You should be paying attention. Amen. Going to read. It's up on the board, Bree. Amen. Lord. You can read it from your paper. You it's said Genesis 15, what? 3 through 6. Then Abram said, "Look, you have given me no offspring, and dead one born, and dead indeed one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your own heir.' Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven, and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be.'" 
and he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Amen. So so Abraham presents him this problem. He says, all I have is Eliza. Um, you've given me no offspring. I don't even have any kids, so I don't know how you can do this. Um, and God gave him a solution immediately. He said, listen, he's not going to be your heir. The one that I give you from your own body will be your heir. And then verse 6 is, is tremendous because this counts for us as well. Again, this is part of this covenant that we can hold on to. When you believe the Lord, he accounts it for, for towards your righteousness. You just got to believe. It's our job to believe. And then when he says move, even if you don't have the strength or the knowledge or the know, he's giving you all that you need for the journey when he's telling you to move. Right. Um, when you think that you don't have enough. And this is a part in the journey where it just felt like as I'm reading it, it's like it felt like Abraham was getting tired. y'all. He's walking. He's away from his family. Again, the, the dream. I mean, the, the God first came to him in Genesis. What chapter? What? Twelve. Where are we at right now? Fifteen. We three chapters away. I don't know if this three days or three years, three months. It does. But it's some time has passed. He away from his comfort zone. He walking. He carrying all everything that he can that he owns. They own donkeys. His wife probably complaining because she ain't had to go nowhere. She been rich her whole life, married to this man. Now all of a sudden they living out in no, nowhere's land. So everybody tired. I could imagine, right? And he's like, God, like how are we gonna do this? All I got is this guy. Like and that guy's right, probably, probably like, gee, thanks. Like, I've been serving you faithfully, and this, you know, and then God gives him a solution. And when God comes in with the solution, um, and when you give God your transparency, he'll give you a solution. When he gives you that solution, it's the energy that you need to be car to carry forward. And then it's your faith. He'll count as righteousness, right? Um, Genesis 15, 18, um, Pastor Desaria. That means it's time for Zaria to read. 15, 18, you just got one verse. Go ahead. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant for Abraham, saying, To your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. Euphrates. Amen. So what God is doing is reconfirming, doubling down on his commitment. Um, now he's giving them specific territory because, again, in, in Genesis 12, he didn't say specifically where it was. And now because of his faith, God has extended the promise, right? And now the, the blessings are getting greater. Um, God's reassurance, God assures, uh, sorry, reassures Abram um, of his promises despite Abram's doubt. Uh, promise of a son. God promises that Abram's heir uh, will be his own biological son. And then the covenant ceremony, God formalizes the covenant with the ceremony symbolizing this commitment. The, the, the scripture goes on to say that. Um, we didn't put that part in here, but then they, it was basically like a, a praise party out there. God did a ceremony and everybody and all those that were in the camp because it was him and then he, it was um, his wife, his nephew, um, a couple of other people, and then, then some, a bunch of servants that he, that he, that he um, left with. Um, everybody there... Um, was assured of the promise. God showed his promises, right? So faith and righteousness, we, we kind of covered this. Abraham's um, belief in God counted as righteousness, um, highlighting the importance of faith. Um, God's assurance, God detailed promises, and the covenant um, ceremony reinforced his commitment and faithfulness. So again, it, there was a ceremony and a, and a great party. Um, the promise of descendants, the multitude of descendants promise illustrates the vastness of God's blessing. Again, God could have gave one son who could have had another son or whatever. But it's just like there's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. 12 sons become the 12 tribes of Israel um, who become the greatest nation ever. Um, and then Jesus Christ comes from one of those sons or, you know, eventually through the descendants. Right. So it started with one. And then it went to another one. He and then he had two sons. His two sons. One of those two sons had twelve sons. And then from the twelve, Christianity is kind of it kind of comes and stems from those twelve tribes of Israel, right? Anybody heard of those twelve tribes of Israel? Okay, so let's go to Genesis chapter seventeen, the sign of the covenant. Somebody go Genesis seventeen one through. Um, let's go, Indy. One through four. Genesis seventeen one through four. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. Okay. 
and I will make my covenant between me and you and multiply you exceedingly. Then Abraham fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, Ask for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. Amen. Um, um, Joe, let's go, five through eight. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from, from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant. To be God, or to, be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Amen. Y'all did a fabulous job, by the way. Yeah, let's give it up for these young people. Thank y'all. Thank y'all. Um, so what is God doing? And I had the ages wrong. God came to Abram, Abram first when he was about 75, 76 years old. His wife was about 50. Now we're chapters later. Again, five chapters mean 25 years or so, I guess, because now he's 99 years old, right? And he's well beyond, and he ain't, still ain't had the kid, right? So there's nothing that God can't do, right? Even in barrenness, now his wife is 70-something years old, um, but he's still, he's doubling down on the promise, and now it's getting more vivid, and that's what God will do. The more obedient we are, the more vivid we can see the promise in great detail. God will give greater details later on, right? Um, and he says, I will make you exceedingly fruitful, make you nations, and kings will come from you. So King David came through this bloodline. King Jesus came through this bloodline, um, and he, made, he established his covenant in them, um, and then he'll give descendants land. Um, you know, that again, that was not their land, but he's just like giving them just land on top of land on top of land, the most beautiful land that can be possessed. Now, y'all march the mic back up here, Mr. Shamar. We're going to go Genesis 17. Let's go 9 through 14. Just do that part. Right there. Okay. And God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised every male child in your generations. He who is born in your house are bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendant. He who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money must be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people he has broken my covenant. Amen. So, so some of the times when God makes a covenant with us, again, this is an Abrahamic covenant. Not all of this stands for us, um, but, but the parts that do carry over to us is that sometimes God will make a covenant to, with us or to us, and it's not just for us, it's for our children, to where you may have to endure the hard part um, and walk it out. But if you do it, he says, if you do this, then I will do this. He said, I will bless your descendants, meaning this. Everybody that's in that bloodline from here on out is blessed. And guess who's in that bloodline? We're in that bloodline, right? You know, so we're blessed. We live a blessed life, right, um, as Christians throughout the ge their generation. So, like, the blessings don't flow. God will continue to be our people. Um, so this is the father of faith. Anybody know the song? Father Abraham and many sons. Like, this is why we sing it, because it wasn't just about him having um, an Isaac, but Isaac had Esau and Jacob, and Jacob had 12 kids. And I can't even begin to give you all their names, right, because I don't know how you can remember them after three Right? But it was 12 of them, right? And, and Jesus Christ, it, first David, but then Jesus Christ came through that bloodline, 
right? So, so literally, God has made these promises that still carry forth forever. Um, so then an interesting thing happened. He, he changed Abram's name to Abraham signifying his new role as the father of many nations, right? So um, just like he um, um, changed um, Paul, Saul to Paul, and then Jacob, Simon, well, Simon's name was Peter. It's like a surname, like they would call, um, but then he became known as, they, they did start calling him, you are Peter, right? You know, it, it was his name, but then he's like, but I want you to be called this part of your name right now, which means rock, um, you know. Um, so it, 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 Jacob's name was changed to Israel because he says, I will give you a nation. So his sons became a nation. And that's when they became the children of Israel. They were all Jacob's descendants of Jacob, Jacob's children, right? So his name was changed to after he wrestled with an angel, like, you know. Because um, he's like, God, you're going to give me this blessing, right? So he wrestled all night <laughs> until he got his blessing. Sometimes you got you to gotta fight for what God has promised you. So there's an identity change. Whenever God, whenever God um, you know, whenever God gives us a promise and he, and we, and he enters this co- these covenants with us, there's a shift. There should be a shift in our identity to where even if you carry the same name, because we don't have the same traditions as them, um, you have a new identity. People saying, weren't you just this or didn't you do like, but, but I'm no longer known by that. I'm known by this. I'm the one that does this, right? Um, you know, and then there's a generational covenant. Um, the everlasting nature of the covenant shows God's long-term faithfulness to where we're still munching off of the goodness of this covenant thousands and thousands and thousands of years later because of his commitment. Just think about it like this. Your obedience could be the gateway for people that are generations away to continue to receive blessings, right? Um, some of them may still carry your name. Some of them may not even carry your name. It could be, um, you know, you have a descendant, you have a son that has a son that has a son that touches some other family, and then God's blessing is just flowing, but he still counts that towards your righteousness. There's a record for us in heaven. Only thing that matters is not what we could do for ourselves, but the things that we did for God. So God can count what you do. Again, one man, you know, everybody heard, anybody heard of Billy Graham? Right. You know, a, a man, they, they had tent revivals and Billy Graham attended a tent revival and nobody knows the name of the guy who got him saved. But God knows it. And, and his name is counted as righteousness. And, and, and Billy Graham went out and got millions of people saved through his crusades. But guess who God is still crediting for that account is the man who came and it might have been 12 people at that tent revival. So out of this church here, again, we ain't got thousands of people or just yet, or we may never have it. Who knows? Whatever God wants to do, right? But just the people who come here, this is why we got to love on people, love God first, love people, because we never know what's being birthed out of our hospitality, out of our coffee and fellowship, out of someone opening the door, opening the back and telling somebody good morning. Uh, over just loving on people the right way. Somebody may be birthed out of this church to go start a great crusade and millions will be saved and it could be a new person that's working on the back door that was like, dang, I don't even know what to say. Get up there. You, like, mom be putting people. So mom gets caught in this righteousness. She's like, get up there, Shamar. And then somebody walks in and Shamar says, "Uh, good morning, here's your communion cup. And she smiles, and then Roy comes by and does something, and then Brenda says, oh, we got coffee over there, and like, she, like, again, all this stuff is attached. It's this chain of events that if we do our job, then the right person or the right people will continue to be touched the right way and go out and influence the world in ways that we could have never imagined. But all we, all we're responsible for is our part. Does that, does that make sense? Um, we got, oh, I forgot, and Pops, and Pops, Listen, and Pops running around in a jar and charge like, yeah, thank you for a day we've never seen before. They're going to remember Deacon Goodfoot on that wall over there. The joy of the Lord. When we, we met the Martins and started hanging out with them. Check this out. We met the Martins and started hanging out with them. And he looked at Pops and said, hey, I know that dude. Oh, man, that's Deacon Goodfoot. They churches used to fellowship with each other way back in the day, and he remembered him having the joy of the Lord. And he didn't just say, oh, that's the dude who was dancing. He's like, that's Deacon Goodfoot. He used to be laughing and dancing and smiling and stuff like that. He got happy because of that joy. So he's filled with the joy of the Lord just because of that. Like, you, you, you know what I mean? And then he remembered Tiffany. He said, oh, that's mama that was singing at that church. Like, you know, so again, you do your job. You light people up. You inspire people in ways that you don't know. And then on certain days, that'll carry you through. 
Like, you know, so we just got to keep doing our job. So the last thing is this. Um, um, God's covenant with Abraham is a powerful testament to his promises and faithfulness, right? Despite the challenges of human frailties, God's commitment remains steadfast. So uh, your assignment this week, go back and study Genesis 12, 15, and 17. Just read the whole story because um, you'll see where even where Abraham, like you, if, if, if you're flowing in the anointing of God, as long as you stay on the path of God, even when you fall off of it, all you got, your responsibility is to get back up and keep on marching. Like there's provision. God will either erase mistakes. He'll work with them, deal with it. Like babies were made along the way. A whole nother nation was born and you could trace it back and say, oh, because th these people went out to live in the desert and they began to worship just a little bit different. They still believed in God, but they had bitterness. They were fighters and things like that. Um, many people believe and conclude, well, this is where the Muslim faith came from. It's through Ishmael. You can literally trace it back that far. So now this is why you have this great war. You have Israel and Palestine who are perpetually at war. Well, that was forecast. What God is saying in here is like this one is going to be against this one. So you got to separate it. You got to put this one out. He's still your son, um, but, you know, we're going to make him great, but great over here. But this is the one that I'm going to do what I'm going to do through. Does that make sense? Like, so it's so much in there to where you don't want to create an Ishmael that doesn't have to be created. <laughs> like, you know, because then they will be at war and there'll be enmity um, between them and your other family that God is blessing you with. So, I mean, there's so many things. But even if you do, right, then God still has provision. And he still wants to do the thing that he's assigned to your life through you. All you got to do is when we mess up, when we sin, when we fall out of faith, just get back in somehow, find our faith and get back on the road, right? Um, so read Genesis 12, 15 and 17. Um, and, it, and it'll tell you the depths of God's plan and his unwavering faithfulness and his promises. And then reflect on those questions. There's three questions there. But I want to kind of open it up. I did a lot of talking, a lot of teaching. But what did you learn? What did you gain? What did you understand about either these covenants directly with Abraham or how they even apply to your life? Or what questions do you have about covenants? That was a lot, huh? Most of it was reading, though. Most of it was reading. We could have just put it up on a board, but as you study, I want you to have the, the main scriptures, like, you know, that go along with what we were talking about, because that deal, all of that deals with the covenant and everything like that. But what, 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 what triggers in your mind? Uh, what questions do you have while well, we still have just a couple minutes? I had a question real quick. Sure. Um, the, this, this covenant in particular has always been a bit difficult for me to wrap my mind around. Like, I'm, I'm trying to understand, like, I guess why Abraham and why why the line is drawn at him in terms of why he's called the father of many nations. I know I, I you know I see where it's at in scripture, right? But in my head I'm just like, well he got a dad and like you know what I mean? Like why the line line drawn at you know Abraham? Like So for you read prior to Genesis twelve, it might start at Genesis nine, ten somewhere, but God makes a covenant even with his dad, but it's again his dad stopped marching. Um, and then Abraham, it might be uh, Genesis 10, but you can't quote me. Just go back and read it because it mentions his dad. Is, his dad is given an assignment. His dad says, I will go no further. This is where I'm going to mourn and this is where I'm going to live. And God said, all right, go to mourn and live there. Um, I still love you. God didn't punish him and take away all his blessings. So they produced and they had a bunch of cattle, a bunch of money. They were rich, rich. But then through his son. He says, okay, let's see if this one was an obedient one. So I want you to go and pick up where your dad left off, basically, and, and continue and go. And when you get there, I'll let you know. Just go to a land, and I'm going to bless you. Uh, why? Many are called, few are chosen. God chooses who he desires uh, for a particular task, uh, maybe because they were righteous and they were obedient, um, just like Noah. Um, the, the earth flooded. Noah's the only surviving um, male uh, grown man. Um, because of his obedience in all of the earth, there was no one else that were obedient. They were so far from the Lord. He says, I'm going to kill everybody and start over. But there was one obedient one to where he didn't have to destroy the earth and start completely over. He did it through um, Noah, uh, maybe because of their righteousness and their obedience. And he obviously had it in him. His dad had been obedient up until the point to where sadness overtook his heart. And he didn't have the, the, either the faith or the endurance to continue. He was so heartbroken. And many times that happens to people. But God sees the thing through. So if he promised them through his descendants this, in the same manner, it doesn't go into the specifics because he didn't get that far with his dad. But it must have been a similar covenant where he told him, start going. 
And then he went so far, his son died, and that's where he stopped. So then Abraham was able to endure, so he received the fullness of the blessing. But God chose him. That's the answer to the simple answer to your question, because God can do what he wants. He chooses who he desires.